Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. If you think that technology is the solution to your problems, your security problems, then you don't understand the technology and you don't understand the problems. That was Adam Levin, author of Swiped, How to Protect Yourself in a World Full of Scammers, Fishers, and Identity Thieves. In this episode of the ISF podcast, we bring you the second of three conversations with Adam and ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. In this episode, Adam goes into detail about the importance of creating a thorough, integrated, cyber-resilient corporate culture. Certainly, of course, corporations are made up of individuals. So it's a point that I very often make when I talk to to businesses, you know, that uh, you can't divorce the two anymore. Because what you do in the home today, you will want to do in business tomorrow if you wait that long. Mm-hmm. So let, let's explore this minimization thing from a business standpoint, because I suspect it could be a little bit more uh, more difficult in that space. It's not really. It First of all, it starts with culture. Right. Um, Bruce Schneier, who's one of the most quoted and quotable people in cyber, said that if you think that technology is the solution to your problems, your security problems, then you don't understand the technology and you don't understand the problems. (laughs) Uh, That too often organizations just fling money. Either they do nothing and hope that they're too little to be relevant or they spend a fortune. And unfortunately, simply spending a fortune on technology don't feed the bulldog when it comes to cybersecurity. So you really need the cultural aspect, which means that everyone from the front desk, the delivery team, the mail room, all the way up through the C-suite into the board of directors have to adopt a culture of privacy and security. And a lot of people try to divorce the two, but you really can't divorce the two. And it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, The other thing is that uh, too many people pray at the altar of convenience as opposed to security. And that's why you see so many things where individuals and companies get into big trouble because they've come up with something to make it easier, but they forgot that there are security aspects there. They also forget the fact that the evolution of technology oftentimes outstrips the evolution of the security required to protect people who use the technology and businesses who use the technology. So part of creating this culture, first of all, you have to look through your entire company and say, what data do I have and where do I have it? Because you, as you know, from breaches, oftentimes a breach is announced. They give you a number or they give you the specific type of data that they think is compromised. And then later on, there's a revision followed by a revision followed by a revision. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your data is? Companies need to do that. Companies need to have a chief information security officer. And as much as I'm a huge fan of IT departments, in fact, I love the, you know, some of my best friends are IT people. (laughs) The most dangerous words in the English language when spoken by a member of the IT department is, don't worry about it, we got it. Mm. This is a team effort. And that means that the legal department, the HR department, the IT department, the C-suite, the board, have to all buy into the concept that this is a problem and this problem if we don't take care, could be an extinction level event. And we have an opportunity as an organization to do everything we can to protect our data. We segment our data. We only allow people to get anywhere near it if there's need to know or need to use. We demand that people use long and strong passwords. We demand there be two-factor authentication. We even provide mobile devices for our people when they're on the road as opposed to having them use their personal devices because personal devices are an enormous point of vulnerability. And think about the fact that how many times are you in a restaurant with your small child and they are going off the wall and you will do anything for a few mm. moments of peace. So you say, here, here's my phone. Just go to YouTube, do whatever you want to do. And they don't realize that sometimes these lovely little people are running around clicking on links. And before you know it, you might have some kind of malware on your on your mobile device, which when connected to your business network could wreak havoc. So it's developing policies that 
make security a core principle of your organization as opposed to a bolt-on. Uh, Anne Kavukian of uh, Canada, she was the former information and privacy officer of Ontario, developed a concept called privacy by design. And then the next evolution of that was security by design. But that's when you create products and services with privacy and security at the core, mm -hmm. as opposed to something that, oh, yeah. Like, for instance, with electronic health records, priority number one was make sure it works. Yep. And unfortunately, sometimes just because something works doesn't mean that it protects the data that it's working with. Mm -hmm. And so many businesses also go to third parties to do data processing, to do different things. And you have to look at your vendor as you. Mm -hmm. That if they get breached, you got breached. And they could bring a world of hurt. If you remember when the CEO of T-Mobile went off the wall because there was a breach at one of the credit reporting agencies, a division that was approving credit or at least analyzing credit uh, for the firm, unfortunately, they got breached. And suddenly 15 million T-Mobile people had a big problem. Mm. Right. Yep. And, you know, this is where the, the HVAC contractor with Target, mm. the list goes on and on of all the companies that have suffered a problem because their vendor suffered a problem. There is some argument that the breach of the healthcare insurers, they were the big three, Primera, Excellus, and Anthem, uh, that there might have been an issue with a subcontractor, at least at one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we do know there was a major security company years and years ago, probably the most secure company in the world that will go nameless, where someone did a phishing attack, got into the network of that company, and then got into one person's email account, got their contacts, and worked the malware, worked its way through the contacts until it ended up in the core of the company where it got the malware actually grabbed some of the source code. And you had millions of fobs that were used by a lot of organizations were contaminated. And another organization got breached because of the contamination of the fobs because somebody got the source code. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are examples of this is the kind of stuff that companies have to look for. Employee training. Your employees are your first line of defense and they could also be your last line of defense. They're also the first point of attack. Mm -hmm. When you look at all of these companies that have had issues, how's it happened? Spear phishing attacks were launched within a company. As a result, they got ransomware on computer systems. There were business compromise emails where people got emails they thought that came from the boss and they wired money to someplace in the middle of nowhere that wasn't. Two major technology companies, iconic technology companies, wired 100 million combined to a company that didn't exist mm -hmm. based on a compromised email. And the third is the W-2 scams. What they do is they'll go at the HR department. They will represent themselves as if they were affiliated with another part of the organization and said, hey, listen, we've, we're doing an analysis. What we need is the backup for the W-2 information. So how you minimize this is you stay on alert. You understand these things can happen. You put technology in place. And then you have really smart people that are monitoring the technology to make sure that even that which you think is fail-safe isn't. So you have to make an allowance for that and understand that it could be a real problem for you. This whole issue of the supply chain, I'm interested in going into that in a bit more detail. I mean, a lot of our members and other organizations that I talk to around the world are very, very concerned about supply chain management. How do you actually understand what it is that somebody that you're working with is doing from a security posture perspective? You can issue a policy. You can ask them to self-audit. You can even go in and audit yourself. But the reality is that those supply chains are now so complicated, so complex, so widely spread, that it becomes very, very difficult for the average organization to be able to devote the right level of resource to actually ensuring that the security that we believe ought to be in place actually is in place on an ongoing basis. Any advice in, in that space? Well, that's where my second and third M's come into play. And, and that is that any company can be secure at 9.01 a.m. and 9.02 a.m. because somebody clicked on the wrong link 
they're not secure anymore. So what you need to have is a protocol in place that the minute they have an issue, the minute they have an issue, they have to contact you and say, we may have had a problem. And that's where then you need to monitor your systems, which you should be doing anyway. You should be checking for vulnerabilities. You should be making sure that patches are applied. As you know, for instance, one of the major credit reporting agencies had a huge problem because they were alerted to a vulnerability. A patch was issued. A memo was sent immediately down to the department within the company that was responsible for making sure the patch was applied and things were monitored properly. The patch never got applied. They never monitored properly. And they had a hundred plus million people in harm's way. So because it's inevitable, regardless of what you do, regardless of how terrific your security may be, all you need is one moment, one crack or crevice, and the bad guys are in. That's why you have to be continuously monitoring. You have to make sure that you have protections within your system, looking for things like data exfiltration, for instance. Uh, one of the problems with Target is the hackers were brilliant. What they did is they, they moved the data sideways, and then they moved it out. And again, it was a problem that was created because of a subcontractor. So you have to be monitoring extensively and again often not one of those well we've done it you know this year we're good mm -hmm. or we're fine now we'll do it next quarter this is unfortunately every minute is a dog year in the cyber world mm -hmm. so you have to remember that and that's where the third m comes into play which is how do you manage the damage and companies have to realize that in the world we live in today with breaches being a certainty and with hackers running wild, that there are two things that regulators, class action lawsuit attorneys, and your business partners and consumers are going to look at. Not only how well did you protect their data, but once you found out that there was an issue, did you move urgently, transparently, and empathetically? And so many companies don't do that. We've seen stories recently of a, a mega technology company that had a breach that they were really debating whether it was really a breach or not. They didn't make an announcement. And if that had occurred a month and a half later, when GDPR went into effect, which is the privacy regulations and the breach notification regulations in Europe, they could have been facing a fine that would boggle the mind. So you have to have a plan. It has to be a cooperative effort with many departments within an organization. It has to be something that takes into account the fact that you're going to have a lot of very freaked out people. Your employees are going to be hysterical. Your customers are going to be hysterical. So you have to have a plan that gives them comfort. You also have to make sure that you make all of the required notifications. Unlike the EU, 52 separate jurisdictions in the United States have breach notification laws. Some are conflicting. Some have different contact people. Some have different notification time frames. Don't try to do it yourself. Bring in a third-party professional who understands how this thing works, who's done it before, so they can take a look at what you've got, take a look at your situation, help you with your media, help you with communicating with your customers and employees, come up with or show you different alternatives as to the kinds of things that you can do to make people feel like you really care about them, and then you have to implement it. And you don't do like one of the credit reporting agencies did where they did everything wrong. They set up a website. They tweeted about it, but it was the wrong website they tweeted about. The website they set up wasn't necessarily secure. The call center they put in place was so overwhelmed that it didn't even know how to deal with it. Um, you have to have a plan. You have to red team that plan. You have to practice it. It has to be the equivalent of muscle memory on your team. And you have to say, as much as I would like to believe the world is a good place, you have to assume and you have to prepare for the worst and be pleasantly surprised and relieved when it isn't the worst. Because that's the difference between a really bad experience or an extinction level event for an organization. Hmm. How many organizations do you think in your experience are going through that process to the level that you've just described? Not enough. They still say that only 38 or 39 or 40 percent of organizations are really focused on cybersecurity like they should be. 
they're all concerned about it. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all concerned about getting a cold, but a lot of us don't take precautions. Concerned about getting the flu, concerned about cancer. And, you know, these breaches, these hack, this is cancer. This is cancer because it comes out of nowhere. It could be sitting for a long period of time before something horrible happens. Then something horrible happens. Then you do everything you can to recover from the horrible thing that happens. But even then, they may still be there. Mm -hmm. Just like with a consumer. If somebody gets their hands on your Social Security number and you've resolved the problem, that doesn't mean it's over. Just like when someone goes, I was a victim of tax-related fraud. And it was identity-related tax fraud. But I solved it. Worked it out with the IRS. Flags on my account. I'm all good now. Except for one thing. If they had enough to file your tax return, they have enough to open new accounts in your name, commit medical identity theft, criminal identity theft, child identity theft. The list goes on and on. So as a result, you not only have to have the plan and you have to execute the plan, but you also have to assume this is not the end of the story. Thanks for tuning in to the second of our three-part series with Adam Levin, Be sure to listen for our third and final episode, in which the conversation focuses on the maturity, collaborative culture, preparation, and responsiveness required for true cyber resilience. Do I not want to brush my teeth? Do I not want to get a cavity taken care of so, for instance, that cavity could suddenly become a root canal problem? Well, it's the same thing with cybersecurity. You You can let it go, but you are putting your business in jeopardy. We know you'll look forward to that conversation. In the meantime, for more resources for CISOs and anyone looking to enhance the security of their business, please visit securityforum.org. And we'd like to hear from you. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or someone you'd like us to interview, get in touch through our website or tweet us at Security Forum. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.